Well, hello, everybody. It is such a delight to be with FTT South Korea. So grateful for the way that you guys serve the body of Christ and serve all around the world. You know, some of my fondest experiences are being in Korea, praying, seeking God together uh, for world evangelization, and it is a privilege to be here today. For those who don't know me, my name is Jimmy Seibert. I serve as the senior pastor at Antioch Community Church in Waco, Texas. Also, I have the privilege of leading the Antioch Movement, which is a church planning movement working in 50 different countries around the world. We often say that our banner statement is to be a people who have a passion for Jesus and his purposes in the earth. And our prayer is that every time we gather, that we fall more in love with Jesus. And every time we gather, we apprehend his heart and his purpose for us as a people. And that's my prayer in our little bit of time here in this plenary session, that we would fall more in love with Jesus and we would capture his purpose in his heart. So I'm gonna pray and then dive into today's material. Spirit of the living God, thank you, thank you, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that we love because you first loved us. And I thank you that everybody listening right now that you are reaching out to with cords of loving kindness. You've initiated through the gospel and your sacrifice, but even today you're initiating by the Holy Spirit and wooing them and drawing them into your heart and into your mind. And we pray, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done in our few moments together in Jesus' name. Well, I want to start by telling you a little bit of my own story, and that will tell you the Antioch story. Uh, when I was 20 years old as a university student, uh, I had just come to know the Lord, was familiar with the things of the Lord, but uh, did not know what it really meant to follow God with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. So through a number of circumstances, I ended up spending three months in, in between my second and third university year in uh, my hometown working, and I uh, decided I'm going to find out if Jesus is really real not just about religion, but if he's really real. And I decided to do this, that I would start in the book of Matthew, I would read a chapter a day, and whatever Jesus did, I would do, and whatever he said to do, I would do it. Now, the only problem is I had never read the Gospels. And so I was astounded by the words of Jesus and then how he lived life that was so different from the kingdom of this world. I often say that by chapter six or six days into this journey, I had given away about everything that I had. I had forgiven everyone I had not planned on forgiving, and my life was being transformed by the words of Jesus. Well, as you know, the Gospels, every chapter was just revealing a new aspect of the goodness of God, the love of God, the power of God, and the kingdom of God. And I remember being stunned in Matthew 18 where Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I thought, wow, the gates of hell are prevailing against the institutions of society, politically and educationally and between people groups. But this church, the gates of hell will never prevail against it. And this kingdom that God is calling me into to seek first, this kingdom that's becoming real because the King Jesus is becoming real, is facilitated through this thing called the church and God wants to change the world through his church. Well, that summer, I'm uh, then <clears throat> I'm headed home, uh, headed back to university after three months of reading the Gospels, and uh, I asked the Lord, what are you doing with me? I mean, I'm crying uncontrollably. I know I've met with the Lord, and God spoke to me this simple phrase, you've asked me uh, to show you that I was real, and I have come. Isn't that beautiful? The beauty of the gospel is not just a construct of theological understanding, it's a movement of the heart towards the person of God in the person of Jesus, and he comes by the Holy Spirit and fills us and then empowers us for every good thing. Well, I got back to university and we began to gather with different friends, and every night we would gather from seven to midnight and we began to experience the book of Acts. So what I'd seen in the gospel, I was now beginning to experience in the book of Acts. And we would pray for one another and minister to one another, and we would begin to see signs and wonders, and we would see people healed and hearts restored and people transformed. And so what was happening was uh, the literal pages of the scripture were coming alive, not because I had learned it from some external uh, force or a book, but because of simply following Jesus, 
gathering in his name house to house and experiencing the power of God. Well, a buddy and I were talking then about these experiences we were having, and we said, golly, if all this is happening because of our intimacy with Jesus and our gathering house to house in the name of Jesus, uh, what what's going on around the world? And my buddy said, well, have you ever heard of missions? Now, remember, I was a new believer and I wasn't familiar with that term, which seems funny today. But I said, uh, no. He's, I said, do you know anybody that knows anything about it? He said, well, let's go to church tomorrow. This was a Saturday. And let's ask around and see if anybody knows anything about missions. So we go to a particular Sunday school class where a lot of university students had gathered, and they said, we have a special speaker today uh, from the country of Thailand that has served 25 years uh, reaching people who have never heard about Jesus, and he wants to answer the question today, what is missions? In that beautiful, the Holy Spirit hears the heart of a little 20-year-old, and he opens up an opportunity of a lifetime. Well, as that man shared so powerfully about God's great commission, his call for believers to be the hands and feet of Jesus and to be distributed so that every tribe and tongue and people and nation hears, my heart was struck. I was just overwhelmed by the reality of that. I go up afterwards to this man and said, what do we do? And I had two or three friends with me and he said, well, I don't uh, know what you guys are doing next summer, but he said, I have a friend who looks for lost tribes in the interior of the nation of Papua New Guinea. Many of them are cannibal tribes. They've never heard about Jesus. And he's looking for some young people that are willing to take treks into the wilderness and even risk their lives for the sake of the gospel. Uh, and would you guys like to go? Well, we didn't know what we were getting into, but our answer was yes. And I remember that next summer flying to Papua New Guinea, not knowing if it was a rainforest or a desert, just knowing that God had called us and with a backpack and a few clothes, and we said yes. And we began to take treks into the jungle, and you would drive as far as you could into the jungle, and then you would hook up with local tribesmen and tradespeople and get in hand dug out canoes. And it was everything that you could imagine of kind of the interior of the uh, of missions. And we would go into these villages and they had never heard the name of Jesus. And the beauty of, the, uh, of this guy's, uh, uh, the missionary we were with, the beauty of his strategy was that idea that eternity is already in their hearts, that they had in their folklore, they had stories of a great flood, they had stories of creation. They didn't call it Adam and Eve, they didn't call it Noah, but they, they had these stories. And so we would take a generator and show these slideshows about creation. And they would begin to mumble among themselves as if they knew the story, just didn't know the people we called Adam and Eve. And then when they got to the flood, again, there would be murmuring among them in their own tribal language as we were translating in three different languages. And they knew about a great flood in their folklore, in their years of passing of oral traditions. They knew about a flood, but then it got to the Savior. And that's the story they didn't know. They lived in fear. Their bones of their ancestors were in the trees. The witch doctors were all present because they wanted to appease the spirits because they didn't have freedom from fear. They didn't have a hope. They didn't connect to the God of creation, the God of the flood. They were fearful of the gods of this earth and the supernatural controlled them. And when they heard about Jesus, the God who loves them, the God who saves them, the God that can heal them and restore them, the God that can eradicate fear, in a moment, the power of God showed up. And I still remember after sharing the gospel or our missionary sharing the gospel, the chief coming and asking a few questions, basically, is this story really true? Can we really be free from fear? Is there really a good God that loves us? Is eternity really secured by a sacrifice that has been made once for all that we don't have to sacrifice to the, uh, to the voodoo gods? We don't have to sacrifice to the witch doctors? You mean that there is a sacrifice that has already been made for us? And as that dialogue went on, his eyes opened. He said, then we will respond. And I had the privilege, as well as my friends, of seeing a village all get on their knees and cry out to the Lord Jesus, the power of God, the salvation of God through the simple message of Jesus that had already been embedded into a culture, but they just needed a laborer. Well, after that summer and experiencing the New Testament in reality in so many powerful ways from seeing 
people who had been raised from the dead to seeing people who had never met a Westerner in their life, never seen a Western church who were gathering and experiencing what we see in Acts 2 and Acts 4 and Acts 8 and Acts 10. I was ruined for the ordinary. And I came back from that, that year of experience with this reality. Jesus is who he says he is. He's real. His church is his plan A for transformation of society. And there is a world that is desperate for Jesus, and they're just looking for laborers. So with that in our minds and that in our hearts, my wife and I married, and we said, God, what would you do with us? Oh, Lord, would you move among us? Would you bring friends along? May we see the New Testament church come alive. And God gave us this passage of Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Do not call to mind former things or ponder things of the past. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And that idea is a, a promise of, yes, God's going to do something new. But for us, it meant the re-emergent of the New Testament church alive and well in the Western world as the place to facilitate the glory of God in all the earth. We believe in the church. We believe in the local church. We believe in doing church in such a way that you can reproduce it anywhere in the world. So we gathered a few friends together and we said, all right, let's live that out. What if we really shared the gospel on a daily basis? What if we really discipled people intentionally so that they discipled others? What if we actually met house to house in community and literally lived out all the one another's we see in Acts 2, 42 through 47? What if we then did church in such a way that we could reproduce it anywhere in the world and begin to send people on that mission? Well, we got out of the gate and we began that process with a little training school inside of a local church. And God began to move uh, powerfully. Now let me pause right here and just run us through a reminder biblically of what God's desire is for the church. And then I will end with a fast forwarding a little bit of our own story and experience to hopefully help you in your own community. You know, when Jesus came, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand and repent obviously of sin, but let go of the world and your worldly way of thinking. Let go of religion, let go of politics ruling your life, and, and lay hold of me. It, it, one of my the great definitions of the kingdom is wherever the king is, there is the kingdom. Wherever the king is not, there is chaos. And then we see Jesus saying pray, that we're to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. He begins to gather people together. He begins to demonstrate the kingdom. He admonishes over and over again, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then we see the power and demonstration of the kingdom of God coming to bear on earth. We see food multiplying. We see disease leaving. We see depression leaving. We see love and community like they've never experienced before. Could you imagine the disciples experiencing the love and friendship of Almighty God face to face? That is the kingdom of God, the intimacy of God, the power of God, the demonstration of God. And then that phrase that I noted earlier where Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There's so many different theologians who are trying to unpack that word in so many ways. But let me simplify it this way. God said, I will gather my people and they will be a force in the earth that will never be stopped as they address and believe in the kingdom of God ruled by a king, Lord Jesus. This people of God will not be stopped. This kingdom will not be stopped because the church is alive by the grace of God. We see through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, he appears to over 500. He <clears throat> declares the kingdom of God, and 120 say we're willing to risk it all. I always think that is such a unique thing, isn't it? That 500 saw the risen Lord. They heard him talk about the kingdom of God. They saw signs and wonders after the resurrection. I guarantee you they told family stories about meeting with Jesus for years to come, but only 120 said, I'm willing to risk my life. So there it is, pastor. Don't worry if everybody doesn't come. 
All you need is that 120. All you need is the committed core that said to the death, we are in. That committed core is always how God has brought revival and resurrection. Everybody's invited. Jesus is extending his arms, absolutely. But that 120 of the 500, they gathered and they said, we're gonna pray, we're gonna seek God. The power of God falls on them. And don't you love it? It said, all those Jews who had gathered from around the world who spoke different languages, who were uh, uh, from different ethnic backgrounds and different uh, experiences, all the Jews had gathered in Jerusalem are hearing the glory of God in their own languages uh, being expressed. I remember being in the streets of Amsterdam and uh, we were there witnessing. And one, we were reading Acts 2 about the power of God fall, falling on people and giving them languages. And we said, Lord, we want to see that happen. We want to get a language that we don't have. And there was a group of Moroccan young men that came up. And we just said, Spirit of God, fill us with the Holy Spirit to witness. And they spoke no English. And so we just began to pray in our prayer language. And they began to hear the glory of God. Their eyes open in this one young man who spoke broken English. He said, how do you know? How you know? How you know? And it wasn't just Arabic that we were speaking or French, which are the two main languages. It was the local village dialect of that he had. And, and we were speaking of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And this young man gave his life to Jesus and all of his friends and the power of God came on them all. Isn't that amazing that God's still working today, just like he did in Acts 2? Well, we fast forward, we see the preaching of Peter, this is that which God promised, and they begin to gather house to house. So what I love, and I'm so grateful for the Korean church, you guys have modeled this so well. But let me just say this, there's two plumb lines that every healthy church has to have, and every life-giving, reproducing church has to have. Jesus is the hero, passion for Jesus, our surrender to Jesus, our submission to Jesus, the beauty of Jesus. If it doesn't look like Jesus, if you don't act like Jesus, if we don't live like Jesus, if we don't love like Jesus, we're missing it. And when we're off, we come back to Jesus. The second is Acts 2, 42 through 47, where that is, wherever that is being lived it out in any village, in any uh, community, in any place around the world, when that's being lived out in the way that we see it described in scripture, the power of God is present and the life of God is being reproduced and it can't be stopped according to Jesus's promise of the church. We started planting churches in those early days, uh, not only investing in our local community, but we began to plant churches in southern Siberia. And we saw God move powerfully, and those churches are flourishing now even 30 years later. I'm so thankful. If any of my Russian friends are out there, we love you. So proud of you guys. But early on, we taught everybody how to seek God, how to make disciples, how to do it house to house and reproduce their lives. There was a young uh, Chinese student, uh, transfer student, living in Russia at the time. And for simple terms, we'll call him Larry. And uh, so in our time, we trained him. We, uh, he became one of our house church leaders. And he learned all the basics of the kingdom just by reading the words of Jesus and the book of Acts and then living that out in community. Well, Larry uh, got expelled from the country after a year. Two years later, uh, some of our guys went into northern China to try to find Larry, how he was doing, hoping that he had stayed true to the Lord, that he had stayed strong in the Lord. And as they found uh, Larry, uh, they said, Larry, how's it going? Are you staying true to the Lord? And he looked at us like, of course I am. And we said, well, what did you do? Uh, how, did you, how have you stayed strong? He said, I just did everything you guys taught me. Seek the face of God on a daily basis. Gathered my friends together. Led all of them to Jesus who wanted to come and those who didn't left. We began to meet house to house. We did Acts 2, 42 through 47. He said, I have about seven or 800 people meeting house to house around our city. I need some help. It's about time you guys got here. I said, yes, this gospel of the kingdom done in a simple, powerful way reproduced itself all over the world for them that believe. Well, let me fast forward uh, to 2001. We had started in 1987. We're planting churches. We're reproducing the local church. 2001, two of our missionaries uh, are imprisoned in Afghanistan. Some of you guys are familiar. During 9-11, there were several foreigners imprisoned. It became an international incident. But I love what one of our gals said. She says, isn't it 
ironic that God would allow some of his children to be put in prison so that millions of people around the world would pray so that the widow and the oppressed would be delivered and the move of God would come into a nation. Hey, I don't know what trials and challenges await all of us, but what I know is in the face of persecution, the church will emerge in power and it will remain. And God is stirring us like never before to be his hands and feet. If you guys know anything about Afghanistan during that time, there were 30 million people in no known gathered church. People had laid their lives down. There were Afghan believers. There were Afghan believers in other countries. But as far as Afghanistan proper, no known gatherings that we knew of. There were people, again, who have laid their lives down. We, our investment in Afghanistan is just a, just a little bit compared to so many people even listening on this uh, uh, message right now. Many people from Korea have given their lives, gave their lives for the gospel in Afghanistan. So this is a group effort. But as people began to pray worldwide and their, their imprisonment process happened, the whole world began to contend. And we had already seen many people, uh, disciples that uh, uh, had already been made. But the, the, the Spirit of God moves in the middle of all that journey. 9-11 happens. Afghanistan goes through turmoil and all the challenges up and down. But what emerged from their imprisonment, what emerged from the prayers of the saints, what emerged from this house church model is now thousands, and I can say that, uh, plus <laughs> of house churches all over the country because some people not just ourselves, but the people of God went in the face of persecution, laid their lives down, were willing to be imprisoned, were willing to contend. The body of Christ laid hold of it, and now there is a move of God that can't be stopped in the country of Afghanistan. So much so that just a few years ago, they came on national TV and said, beware of these evil house church gatherings in the name of Jesus. Wow, may it be said of us, oh, beware of these people of God that love so thoroughly, love so deeply, who meet house to house and have a plan for the glory of God. Well, let's fast forward. It is 2020 and the earth is shaking and God is shouting. The earth is literally shaking and God is shouting, now is the time. Most of us are familiar with Matthew 24, 14. There'll be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes. Lawlessness in the land will cause great fear and people's heart to grow cold. Everything described in Matthew 24 leading up to 24, 14 is coming into play right now. And here's what we learned from our Afghan days over the last 20 years. Wherever the greatest shaking is, that's where God's about to move the most powerfully. And we have said we want to be ready to run to the battle, not from the battle. So when the Iraq war hit, we send laborers into Iraq. When the uh, uh, Arab Spring hits, we go into the Middle East like never before. When nations are uh, 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 shaking with different kinds of national tragedies to wars, to Syria, to wherever, we run into the battle, not away from it. And too many times we as the church are not ready to go because we ha don't have a simple model of church that we can reproduce anywhere, and we also find ourselves pulling away instead of diving in. So here's my invitation to all of us. It is a moment in history that will never happen again. There is a moment in history where the whole world's on pause. I know the lockdowns. I know the protocols. We are honoring that. We are honoring people and all of that. But I am telling you, this is the church's greatest hour. Matthew 24, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. And there is no other vessel made for now but the church. Because we do not have to fear anything. We are fearless because we know that eternity is our hearts. We know how to love Jesus. We know how to connect with Jesus. We know how to do discipleship because we've done it in our local church. We know how to do Acts 2, 42 through 47 because we've done it in our local church. We are willing to give our lives because eternity is set. We have nothing to lose and everything to gain. As God has been awaking the sleeping, the, the not the sleeping, but the judge, excuse me, the giant of the Korean church. I want to admonish you all the more sharpen and hone all the things that brought those early day revivals. Resharpen those skills. Seek God. What I call the five circles of church, and I'll end with this. These five circles need to be happening in every local church for the power of God. And then the spirit of the Lord will speak like he did in Acts 13 to go to the field that God has called you to. Circle one, men and women of prayer. Not just corporate, but individually seeking God and teaching people how to pray 
singularly and simply circle one, circle two, twos and threes in discipleship. Who are you investing in? Who's investing in someone? Who's investing in someone else? That intentional discipleship where you're asking three questions. Who, how's your relationship with God and how can we help you? What's going on, on the inside of your world and what do we need to repent of? And who are you reaching out to and went into Jesus and discipling? We've got circle one prayer. Circle two is discipleship. Circle three is house to house. We must have community. You guys are great at this. You get this. But that community is a missional community. Remember in Acts 2, 42 through 47, they're ministering to one another. They're sharing the word. But it says people are being added day by day. May your house church shake your apartment complex. May it be shaking your community so that everyone around looks and is drawn into it. And then that fourth circle is the gathered church where we find those fivefold ministry gifts to equip and empower. There is a power to the gathered church. Sometimes you can do it, sometimes you can't in different cultures. That's why the first three circles are paramount for every disciple maker. This fourth one is a privilege, but we leverage it for all we're worth and we're equipping and training people and strengthening them to go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Circle five is we impact the world. We take our gifts, our callings, and our skills. As you guys know, all over the world right now, you're not going to get into a country with a missionary visa. For the most part, it's going to be through business, through healthcare, through education, through whatever gift he's given you. Whatever he has put in your hand, it matters. You're gifted by God to go. These five circles of church lived out and ignited day by day by the grace of God will produce the greatest revival we've ever seen. I am ready for it. I believe in the Korean church. I believe in you guys. Our story is one of attempting and committed to do this over and over again. And we're not going to stop until we all get to see him face to face. So my prayer as I end is this. May this little simple talk make you believe again in Jesus. May it make you believe again in the church. And may the Korean church be ignited in partnership with the body of Christ worldwide like never before to see his kingdom come and his will be done in our lifetime. Spirit of the living God, would you come right now and pour your power out? Spirit of the living God, would you pour belief again in the local church? And God, may you ignite an Acts 13 movement where through ministering to you and to one another, you speak and send out men and women, even from this talk, to those who've never heard, because we believe, O oh Lord, that your desire is that all hear and all know in our lifetime, even in this moment, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.